Good morning, everyone. It has been a couple of very cold days since you last saw me. We had some record-breaking cold move through that dropped temps down into the mid-teens in a lot of North Georgia. I'm not sure it got quite that cold here, but it definitely got into the teens. Between that and the ridiculous gas prices right now, I'm kind of sticking close today because I do have a lot going on later this week. But if you can't tell, this spot has been recently burned, which is awesome. This is an area that I have never seen burned, and as far as I know, it has never been burned, uh, at least since it's been public land. And uh, as you can see, there's tons of really nice stump holes, and it just looks like a great place to walk around. So we're going to do just that. Temps are kind of warming up from the, uh, the cold front we just had, so it's not particularly warm today, but it's also not cold, especially if the wind stops blowing. So part of the reason I'm so excited they burn this area is because it's probably one of the more neglected but at the same time special regions in the Georgia Piedmont because you have these fairly gargantuan longleaf pines. Like, look at the size of this tree right here. That one right there is titanic. In order for these big trees to create more longleaf pines and for those longleaf pines to flourish, we need fire. There's just countless other benefits to burning. I know that a lot of people don't really understand how control burning works. Personally, I think we need way more fire to come back to the woods in the southeast because, as you can see, this forest looks so much better than it did with all of that shrubby vegetation and leaf litter clogging up the forest floor. And of course, within a couple of months, most of that stuff will start to return even faster and stronger than ever. And the overall productivity of this ecosystem will go up when the grasses and things start coming up out of this recently burned soil. Now that the canopy is a little bit more open. So a lot of people that are concerned about public burns say they kill more wildlife than they benefit, which is simply not true. And I can prove that to you right now by showing you this charred to bits log. This is an absolutely burned to pieces log the toughest part of the wood still remains, and uh, underneath said log was a little redback salamander. Probably the last thing you would expect to be able to survive an intense fire, yet here he is. And the reason for that is because these animals have adapted alongside fire. Back before the Americas were colonized, fire like this was more natural, and there's even reports that Native Americans tended to the wilderness, kind of like we try to replicate today with our controlled burns. So fire is nothing new in this type of habitat. In, re in reality, it's nothing new anywhere in the United States. In the grand scheme of things, these woods have been burning longer than they haven't. And as a result, all of these animals, or at least the ancestors of these animals, have lived alongside fire perfectly for millennia without human interference. And now that humans are here and we're very scared of fire by nature, there's less of it in places that actually rely on it to keep the ecosystem functioning at its full potential. So either way, just an interesting observation and a little bit of a rant to start the video. I'm looking forward to spending the rest of the day in this habitat and hopefully I'll be able to turn up some more herps, uh, but it is nice to see that little red back. Here's another red back. This one's a little more colorful than the first. He's got a nice vibrant stripe down his back, but he's actually under this rock right here. So I'm going to let him crawl back under there. But yet another one of these guys. I'm assuming we'll probably see quite a few of them today. They seem to be everywhere lately, which is weird because we didn't see that many over the course of the winter. There was a nice double flip. You can barely see the other one because it's in a hole. But two more southern redbacks. This little area is loaded with them. It's very cool to see. Oh my god. That's a coach whip. <laughs> Look right there. I'm going to grab him before he gets away, but holy crap. This guy is looking a little bit rough around the edges. He's got he's super dark. I thought it was a racer at first. I really, it's definitely in shed, of course, so it's a little bit darker than it would be otherwise. But holy crap. I did not realize what I was looking at for a second. I genuinely thought it was a racer. That is, whoa! That is so insane. <laughs> So he was sitting coiled up right here next to this nice flat rock here, and I'm assuming he overwintered right here. 
But that is so awesome. Another huge coach whip. I mean, this thing isn't, I don't think it's more than five and a half feet, but it's just, it's insane to me. I can't believe these things live here right down the street from my house. It's unbelievable. And this guy's got something. This guy's actually got something sticking out of his skin right here. I think it might be a thorn or something. We're going to pull it out for him. Yeah, look at that. That's gnarly. He had a thorn. <laughs> it's just like a snake splinter. That's super strange. Sometimes you'll see snakes with cactuses stuck in them, but that's a first for me. Seeing these guys in habitat with some sort of frequency is very encouraging for me in my search for a pine snake in this area because I never see these guys on the road. I've seen one alive and one dead versus three in habitat. So I'm kind of starting to wonder if just hiking in the best habitat in this general area is the best way to find some of the rare snakes around here. Really, they don't have too much of a reason to leave this super nice open rocky habitat. There's plenty of perfect foraging habitats, etc., overwintering sites for these bigger snakes like coach whips and pine snakes. But even in shed, this is such an awesome snake. It's huge and relatively healthy. It's got some sort of kind of overwintering blisters going on around its the tip of its mouth. But other than that, it doesn't really have a blemish on it. It's got a good body weight. What a regal snake, even deep in shed. That thing is just amazing. <laughs> I could sit here and look at this thing all day, but we're going to leave him back to his business. What a pleasure to get to find this guy. I think, I believe this is only my fourth Eastern Coach Whip that I've seen alive in North Georgia. So, um, really, I think it's my fourth in three years. I believe I got two last year, and every other year I've only gotten one. So, we're getting a little bit of a head start with this guy this year. So, hopefully, this will be the first of several we see in this region this year. But, either way, gigantic snake. You can see, even as a not that big adult, the snake is still probably five and a half feet. I mean, they are truly one of our biggest species. And uh, this one looks to be a female to me. Got a pretty short tail. You can see her vent is about right there. So likely a big female that will hopefully be giving birth to the next generation this year. So she's got stuff to do. We're going to leave her to her business and keep hiking, see if we can find anything else. But that is the first snake of the day. Nice Eastern Coach Whip. All right, beautiful. Let's put you back over here by your rock. She was just kind of, well, she knows where she's at. <laughs> that is so cool. I can't express to you how cool that is. So yeah, after how cold it was last night, I wasn't really expecting to see any snakes, much less a coach whip of all things. I mean, that is, frankly unbelievable i really <laughs> i'm just kind of in shock right now i i've seen him here before but it's always you know several dozen outings between coach whips at the spot and you know i've walked past that exact rock probably 10 times in the last three months just you know because this spot's close to my house so i come out here a lot it's really hard to even put into words the amount of work that i put into finding that snake and i actually while I was sitting here talking just now, I spotted something pretty cool. <laughs> Look at this. Very nice. I spotted that while I was talking just now. I had no idea that was sitting there when I started the clip. Very cool. Well, today was definitely a quality over quantity type of day, and that is fine with me, especially considering how cold it was last night. I really didn't have any expectations of actually seeing any snakes today. just wanted to get out of the house, and I'm very glad I did. So, yeah, I'm probably going to pick this one up next time I get out in the field, which will probably be either tomorrow or the next day. So, I will see you guys then. All right, everyone, it is the next night. I spent most of the day editing and running errands, but it's actually getting dark now. It's been raining all day, so I'm gonna go for a quick drive and see if I can see anything. Normally we just walk, but I'm gonna go kind of out to an area that I don't really do much night cruising in the rain and just see what turns up. Hopefully we'll get a little bit of a different cast of characters than what we get here at the house. So uh, I'm gonna get out there and I will let you guys know what I see. All right, here's our first not wood frog of the night. This is a nice southern leopard frog. He's got a really cool green smear on his back. These frogs definitely, oh, 
These frogs definitely aren't uncommon, but I definitely don't see them as much as I would expect to in this area. So kind of neat. This is a nice, healthy, big adult too. So very cool to see. We're gonna get him out of the road and keep cruising. Aha, the classic rainy night lard. Look at this unit. That's a sizable toad, ladies and gentlemen. That's exactly what I was hoping to see tonight. It actually isn't, but you know, I have a lot of admiration for this toad. So yeah, we're gonna make sure it doesn't get run over and get him out of the road, but a nice American toad here is our next frog that we actually stop for. There's so many peepers and chorus frogs on the road that it wouldn't even be possible to stop and move them all. So I've just been driving around them. There's basically no one on the roads tonight though, which is really cool. It seems like almost every time we get a good rainy night the traffic just comes out of nowhere and tonight has been the opposite of that i haven't even seen a single car since i started cruising so either way we're gonna make sure this guy gets out of the road and get back to it another one very nice out of the road with you too you're too big and handsome to die There's a toad. I was trying to start a little rant real quick, but I guess we'll move this toad first. Another sizable man. Actually, it's probably a woman. Look at that. All right, guys, so we're kind of cruising through that same area where we found the coach whip earlier in this episode, and I wanted to say a few more things uh, about specifically how that snake itself can benefit from that fire. Coach whips are actually about as good of an example as you'll find of a snake that benefits tremendously from good fire. And uh, looks like we have another frog coming up here, or a toad. I think it's a toad. All right, we're gonna move this guy first and then I will continue. There's lots of peepers out there tonight. Like I was saying, um, coach whips are one of those species that benefits tremendously from good fire because they are very, very specialized in the microhabitats they use here and really throughout their range, but they prefer open, hot habitats. They're snakes that prefer to live in some of the most hostile habitats in the US. So for example, out west, they're fairly common throughout a lot of the southern Great Plains because it's all open. And even if that gets converted to agriculture, or something, you know, that's not natural, it still works for them because it's nice and open. Habitat degradation here works very differently for them because um, a lot of the area is less likely to become, you know, agriculture and more likely to become neighborhoods where people are scared of fire. So when you have neighborhoods coming right into the habitat of these animals, it's less likely to get burned. And when it's less likely to get burned, that open habitat the coach whips prefer and their food, such as race runners and, and all these little lizards that they like eating and even other snakes become less common. And they kind of get snuffed out of that microhabitat as soon as the canopy closes and it's no longer open. And they're not the only snake that follows that trend, but they're a good example. And I just wanted to say something about that now because I know I didn't earlier and I was kind of thinking about it and I realized how perfect of an example that is of good fire working well. So if that individual snake so desires, it can now expand its foraging territory into that more open habitat that has now been burned. And in turn, that opens up the niche that that individual animal wants filled in the more open habitat, allowing a different juvenile coach whip to grow to adulthood because it's not being outcompeted. So then again, all of this is hypothetical, but you can see how this, this kind of cascade effect applies when you burn an ecosystem. And this I think is especially important in places like Metro Atlanta where there's less and less natural habitat every day, more and more neighborhoods, meaning less and less places that are actually getting burned. By nature, people are scared of fire. There's a bunch of deer over there and they don't wanna to have to deal with smoke clouds, which really aren't that big of a deal when it comes to controlled burns. And there's also next to zero risk. The people that actually do these burns are very well-trained professionals. I'm gonna cruise until I see something a little bit out of the ordinary and then we'll stop and look at it. 
All right, I decided to get out and walk a second here because there is a nice little wetland here I've never really looked at. And as you can hear, there's tons of frogs. And there's a couple in the road. This is a peeper, unsurprisingly. And that is another peeper just up the road. And as you can hear, <laughs> it's just deafening out here. I see one. He has a raft. Look at his raft. <laughs> That's funny. Just floating on a little log out there, peeping his heart out. I can see a bunch of them out there on that same little stretch of vegetation and stuff. But I'm not seeing any right close to me, weirdly enough. Maybe they just got spooked by my presence. Either way, very cool. I'm going to get back on the road and put this pond on my to-do list for a little bit earlier in the season next year, and we'll come out here and see what all's out. There's a possum. What's up, dude? Hello, friend. Oh, he doesn't want to be my friend, though. That's unfortunate. Those guys love coming out in the rain to eat frogs. A diller. The usual cast of characters is definitely out in abundance tonight. What is this? It's a little snaky looking. That's trash. I was kind of hoping we'd see a brown snake or something tonight, but uh, it's nice and warm. It's in the high 50s, but it's just been a lot of toads and an absolute smattering of spring peepers, and that's been about it on the road. Um, didn't really see anything unusual like I was hoping, but uh, the fact that we haven't seen a single salamander is really weird. And I think that's probably a good indicator that snake season is about to come in in a big way. So anyways, I'm kind of making my way back home at this point. Um, there was a lot of activity, just not anything out of the ordinary. Um, just like I said, tons of spring peepers. There went on right there and not much else. Looks like we have a couple bigger things right here. It's all trash. But yeah, not a single spotted salamander, so. Um, so I'm in complete disbelief about what just happened. I decided to cruise a little bit further and I saw a weird looking frog in the road. And uh, it's a wood frog, five minutes from my house. Holy That is absolutely unbelievable. If you'll recall, I found a dead one earlier this year and I wasn't positive about the identification but this confirms it. There are in fact wood frogs here at my house. I'm within walking distance of my driveway, just a little bit further past where I usually go. And sure enough, right there sits a wood frog. I just, I cannot believe what I'm seeing. This is incredible. All right, so I'm just gonna drive down to my driveway real quick and we're gonna get a better look at this wood frog and then we'll come put him back right where we found him. But it is so ridiculous. This is the road I live on. This, I am driving on the road I live on. I'm just at the far end where I never go. And now revisiting it at the right time of year, it kind of feels weird saying this, but I actually did just find a wood frog in my home county, which is, uh, that was a toad. I mean, it makes sense that they're here. The habitat looks good, but it's just ridiculous. I mean, I'm not even a mile from my house, yet there are no wood frogs right at the base of my driveway where I normally walk this road. But if you drive just a mile down the road or so, there's wood frogs. I mean, at least one wood frog. I haven't seen any other ones, but that is just incredible to me. That even the most common frogs, like wood frogs, I mean, 
globally, they're a very common frog with an extensive range going all the way up into Alaska. But down here at the southern limits of their, their distribution, I mean, they were right under my nose and I didn't know it until today. Well, I had a hint earlier this year when I found a dead one, but I wasn't sure what I was looking at and uh, I wanted to make sure I could get a live one before I got too excited about it. And sure enough, tonight, we did it. So I'm gonna drive up to my driveway. We're gonna get another look at this wood frog. I'm gonna take some pictures and we'll come let him go. Well, it may not look like much, but that is quite possibly the most important frog I have ever found. <laughs> For the most part, the frogs in Georgia are all pretty common with a few exceptions. So finding common frogs in rare places is kind of the, uh, the most important thing you can do in terms of, of frog surveying in the state. Picking up a new county for this species at the southern extent of their range in the U.S., which ranges all the way to Alaska, like I just said, is incredibly cool and incredibly important to me personally to be able to document yet another species in my home county, which every year goes up a little bit, and I'm kind of running out of things that could possibly be found here to find. So each new species I'm able to add to the diversity list for this county is incredibly exciting, and this guy is no exception. Not a terribly exceptional looking wood frog, I'm assuming it's a young male. I think that these guys are actually going to prove to be pretty common on that little stretch of road, but like I said, I never go down there. So this is just, what a way to end the night and to end this episode that's just been kind of crazy. A coach whip and a wood frog pretty much at the same spot. There's not many places that you can find these two species living together alongside each other, even though they probably rarely, if ever, come in contact because they're very different lifestyles. But that is absolutely fantastic, and it makes my month to see this frog. Like I said, I had a pretty good idea that they were here after finding what I assumed was a dead one uh, while exploring a new vernal pool I'd never been to. But to actually get my hands on a live one and get to photograph this frog, it means the world to me. So we're going to do just that, and I'm going to drive him back to where we found him. And I will probably wrap this video up here with one last look at this beautiful frog. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you all in the next episode.